Rachel, thanks so much for coming on the air with us today. Greatly appreciate your time today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, my background, as you've, you've summed up, is in public health, uh, public health emergencies. How do, we, how do we learn from them? How do we communicate more effectively when they happen? Right. Obviously, for most people in public health, um, COVID-19 has been, been our focus, and for me especially, because this, this is my subset kind of of the public health world. Um, I'm a, a fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health and a public health uh, researcher also at NYU and a contributor to Dear Pandemic, which has been focusing on answering uh, readers' questions uh, around various COVID-related issues over the course of the past year. So excited to talk with your audience and all of you and uh, hear what, what it is that, you know, what questions you have. So can you just give the real definition of what is the coronavirus? And is it really similar to the flu in Zika? Because I know Zika has a lot of, you know, it was asymptomatic, just like coronavirus. Uh, so is there similarities with the flu and Zika? Sure. So um, the the coronavirus is, um, it's a also known as SARS-CoV-2. That's the, the description of the virus, but it is a SARS type virus. So that has to do with kind of the structure of the virus and probably is a little bit too, too in the weeds, but um, it's, it's a virus in the sense that, or what, what would be the key takeaway is that um, antibiotics don't do anything for it, right? We have bacteria infections and we have viral infections. Your antibiotics are a lot of medicines we're used to, to taking to treat things, mm -hmm. can treat bacterial infections, but they can't treat viral ones. So where we sit or why it, we, we've seen comparisons to uh, the flu, for example, is both because it's also a virus, but also because the symptoms are pretty similar. Um, it, you know, sometimes it was hard in the beginning to decide or to determine if somebody was having flu-like symptoms. That's how we've described some of the symptoms related to COVID. But we also know that COVID-19, um, there are a lot of different experiences people have with the virus, right? So you mentioned that some people have asymptomatic infections. Some people have um, what seems like a respiratory infection. So, you know, you're coughing, you're sneezing, you have a fever. Um, some people get deep lung infections. And then, of course, there are serious hospitalizations and deaths of, that have arisen from, from COVID-19. So there's a really wide range of, of symptoms associated with it. But I think it's getting all those comparisons to the flu because early on, we thought that the symptoms were, were pretty similar and people were more familiar with the flu. Zika is kind of a, a different animal unto itself because the, the Zika virus was spread by mosquitoes. So we didn't think that there was that much kind of human to, to human or as much human to human transmission that we were concerned about, but we were really concerned about uh, people who would be being exposed to, to mosquitoes. We don't have that concern with, with coronavirus. We just have the concern that it spreads from, from, person, from person to person. So instead of focusing on the mosquitoes, we've got to focus on humans, which is sometimes more or less challenging. I agree. It seems like it's a more complex animal because we have people that still are calling this virus a hoax, which is extremely sad. Uh, yeah. But we'll, we'll go more into this. So my thing is with this is that now we're hearing a lot about these variants, South Africa, Brazil, England. With that said, you know, can you speak about these variants? Because I know a lot of them are more contagious. Uh, and is, will the vaccines work as far as taking care of, you know, obviously the strand we have here in America, but also these other strands that are more contagious? Are you worried about that stuff? So it's a great point that, um, so all viruses mutate. It's not that surprising that we're seeing new variants. We would expect that this is gonna, gonna happen. Each year, you know, a, a virus like the flu virus, one that we're familiar with, uh, the strain can look a little bit different even though the general structure is pretty similar. So like you suggested, what, what a variant means can, what a variant means can vary. <laughs> um, meaning, um, you know, is it more contagious? Uh, what is, because it can spread more easily from person to person? Uh, is it more, um, does it cause worse symptoms? It's gonna depend on, on the specific structure of the variant. Um, but I think the reason that it, it is, you know, kind of raised some, some alarm bells is because when the vaccines were in development, this wasn't kind of the structure of the virus they were necessarily being tested on. That being said, now that the variants 
some of the variants we know about are here, the one that's um, come from the UK or South Africa, Brazil, there's, there's almost getting to be too many to, to name or number, but I, I know we are, we are working on that. Um, we are seeing that the vaccines are pretty effective uh, against them. So Pfizer came out and said that their vaccine was as effective against the uh, a few of the new variants, which is which is really promising. Uh, and other pharmaceutical companies have mentioned that um, kind of updating the vaccine would be relatively simple, all things considered, for the new variants. So what we lose. Um, is time when we have, you know, we that that delayed window where a pharmaceutical company would possibly need to be updating their vaccine to be as responsive as possible to the to the slight kind of variation in how the virus is structured in a new variant means that we lose that window of of time to kind of use the vaccine as as a tool or as um to kind of uh, have that as an to, that we lose a, a little bit of effectiveness of the vaccine in the interim. So, so far we think we're in pretty good shape, uh, especially with kind of that news from Pfizer, but we know that there is a little bit of an open question of how the vaccines are going to um, work in response to some of these variants. So we wanna get people vaccinated as quickly as possible while we think that the, the variants so far are able to be treated by the current vaccine or um, prevented by the current vaccine. Rachel, you can correct me if I'm wrong, with the mRNA, uh, there is, if there is a mutation, and obviously, as you explained, and with all these new variants, there's going to be, with that mRNA uh, technology, they can kind of, you know, kind of play with, I guess you would say, I don't know the medical terminology, you would know better than me, uh, of how that vaccine will adapt to all these different variants. Isn't that correct with that new technology? Yes, that's right. So the advantage of the mRNA vaccine is the, or one way I like to think about them is like, um, it's giving your, it's an instruction manual. It's, it's giving your body instructions of how to make a particular protein called the spike protein so that it can build antibodies for, for the vaccine. So if, uh, if for the virus. Um, and so if the virus variant has changed a little bit, then we just need to update the instructions rather than starting from scratch. Um, and so it's not, um, the reason that mRNA vaccines can come so quickly is because uh, they're built around this instruction manual approach rather than needing to have like the entire piece of furniture, for example, built before it's delivered. So um, that, that's, that's spot on. We've heard a lot of discrepancies about how the virus had started. Uh, the WHO, it was uh, talking with China about, you know, how bats, uh, and that's how that um, that theory went with the bats and how they infected people. There's also another theory that there was a lab in China and that the virus could have, you know, infected someone there. And that's how it kind of escaped and, you know, infected all a bunch of people. And obviously we live in a small world, even though it's a big world, people travel, stuff gets around. We just heard Dr. Redfield, the former CDC director from the Trump administration, rather, came out and said that he believes that it is the theory that someone got contaminated in the lab and that's how the virus started. What is your opinion on this? Yeah, so in full transparency, I'm not a virologist, so I'm a little outside my wheelhouse, but I, I can give kind of my perspective, right. which... From, from virologists that I have talked to or from what I know, it takes a long time to actually figure out the specific origin of a virus, so, meaning like was it, was it created or how did it evolve over time? When we study how it's kind of evolved over time, that's when it becomes easier to trace it back to say it jumping from an animal to an animal to a human like is proposed to have happened at, at a wet market or in right. some space in, in China. In contrast to it already having been manufactured and then um, spread by an individual in a lab. So I think that there's a, the reason there are competing theories is because uh, we're not patient and uh, it we're, we don't we don't have that answer yet. And so I think that what we want is transparency and figuring out what was the origin. We want a lot of virologists and various kind of hands on deck to be able to study kind of that origin piece. And I'm not sure we have that level of transparency at this point in time, but I don't necessarily think that um, Dr. Redfield uh, is the 
the dominant voice, you know, I'm not sure that everybody agrees with him, you know, Dr. Fauci, various other kind of uh, public health leaders that are in, in uh, working on these issues. So, you know, the, the common um, thought was that it, it had kind of jumped from animal to human and been released in one of these wet markets or other spaces. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, we're, we're still not 100% sure. Right. So we have a lot of problems with health care. And if this pandemic comes up again with some other, you know, different pandemic or even coronavirus comes back mutated worse, it's it's going to be a huge problem. So what should the healthcare system do? Because everything is made in China now, whether it's ventilators, medicine, uh, mass. Um, and I think that the current pandemic reflects that we need to reinvest in a national approach to pandemic um pandemic response. And what that looks like, I think can, it will vary, but it, there's a few things that kind of come to mind. One is we need to actually have a, a an infrastructure, an IT or in, um, information system infrastructure where we can actually be collecting data on what's happening, right? So we didn't know the virus is spreading. We didn't know there was a pandemic here because we had no real streamlined system to, to get that information. We still, frankly, don't have a good handle often on where cases are, um, you know, what testing is happening, et cetera. So we need support for an electronic understanding of, of health threats. Um, we need a national strategy also for what states should be doing to collect this information, to work with their healthcare systems, right? Because each healthcare system can do things differently, each hospital, each clinic, et cetera. And it's really spread out. So what one doctor's doing somewhere is could be really different from what someone else is doing. So we need that national level guidance. We need support for the states. Uh, granted, you know, we're the United States, we have federalism. The states are going to do what they want to do, but they do rely on the federal government for guidance and they also rely on them for resources. So as a condition of requesting resources from the federal government, there can be a little bit of a give and take there. Yes. You know, if you're going to take our ventilators, if you're going to take our masks from the federal government, if you want our intellectual and staffing support, here's how you should be approaching the response. And I think we can have a little bit of give and take there so that, you know, if Texas is going to remove mask mandates, but then they run out of PPE, well, that should be a little bit of a of a trade off. And that's where a stronger national government uh, could could play a valuable role in terms of actually having the resources. Yes, things are manufactured abroad and thinking about bringing some manufacturing or having the ability to kind of have. Um, MOUs, memos of understanding in place to scale up some capacity in the U.S. more quickly to produce some of this stuff would be really important. You know, knowing which factories you'd go to, knowing which pharmaceuticals you would go to, et cetera, would be great. But also we do historically have something called the National Strategic Stockpile. When right. the Trump administration went to that stockpile, they found broken ventilators, masks that were out of date, you know, all of this kind of really uh, crappy, the, a crappy state of PPE. And so like, let's also just keep up with the resources we have dedicated. And we could have uh, really been supporting our healthcare workforce in a much better way had we just been doing the basics to maintain things we've already identified as important. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about, obviously, as the richest country in the world, uh, we're getting a lot of people vaccinated. Uh, President Biden just bought, I believe, 600 million or more doses of vaccine. But, you know, we're only half of the world right here, less than half, yeah. I mean, probably like 10, 15 percent of the yeah, world yeah, yeah. as far as the U.S. Europe has their own. They have AstraZeneca. And I think uh, the Biden administration is also shipping some Pfizer and other vaccines over to Europe. But with that said, we have tons of people that live in the continent of Africa. We have people all over in that area. And that's probably one of the huge population centers uh, in the world. Lot, these people are not going to get vaccines as talked about for maybe another two years. Mm -hmm. What happens if these people travel to Europe? They're not vaccinated. They could still have, you know, another, there could be another mutation. There's also talk of this patents with the pharmaceutical industry. And this goes under the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And you can clarify it because you probably know more about this than me, that they are not selling. Okay. They're not selling the patents over 
you know, to these other countries so they can develop this, which can, you know, make sure that we vaccinate not just this country in Europe, but the whole entire world. You know, Russia, I know, has their vaccine. China has their vaccine. But these countries in Africa are very underdeveloped for the majority. And there's tons and tons of people living there. And there's going to be a lot of deaths if, you know, they don't get vaccinated for two or three years. So, what can you explain to the viewers about that? And that's going to end up affecting us in the long run if we don't work with these companies and demand that they vaccinate people all over the world. Yep, it's such a good point. So the reality is we can feel decently good about how many Americans are getting vaccinated. You know, similar behind Israel and the UK, we're really, we're, we're doing well. Um, and we know that there's going to be ongoing challenges here, but those really kind of pale in comparison to the because we have vaccine supply and it's very evident we're going to have vaccine supply, whereas there are so many countries that do not. Um, so the U.S. is, is um, as the original kind of agreements with these pharmaceutical companies did not compel them to share information about the vaccines. And that is something that the U.S. could have done when uh, the vaccines were under development, but to, was not done. And it's unclear to me what could be done at this point in time to compel that to move forward, whether that would be kind of a guarantee of a certain number of doses from the original companies or some kind of financial incentive to, to give it to kind of um, the, the other nations so that they can produce it in country. But the reality is um, we should care that the rest of the world is not getting vaccinated, just like we should care because the pandemic originated in another country, right? I mean, the reality is if there's, no, it's like we haven't learned from the past year that this is a global problem. It's a global problem if other people don't get vaccinated because as you mentioned, um, there can be new variants. And just because our vaccines are working for the current variants doesn't mean they're gonna work for another one in the future. Now that is also my response just now, an incredibly US centric way to think about it. That's the pitch to an American of why you should care about um, people in other, as an individual, about people in other countries not getting vaccinated. There's a whole other ethical question of the fact that we have these resources, we've just been in a global right. pandemic and are not sharing them. And we have frankly more than we need in the US. We are sitting on 145 million doses of AstraZeneca that had not yet been approved in the United States. I think they're now being shipped to Mexico, or at least some of them are. Um, but there's an ethical quandary there. You know, People are going to die from this virus, and yet we have the vaccine capacity to at least start assisting. Um, I think that the last kind of thing to mention around this issue and, and why it is such an issue is both China and Russia, as you said, have their own vaccines and they are sharing them for free yeah. with a lot of countries. You know, they're giving them to, to Pakistan, for example, or, or other nations. And the reality is that's a form of diplomacy. Right. Um, and so if we think about this as, in a global context, we as the United States taking this US centric view, we are also, uh, you know, this is an inflection point for democracy in the world too. Uh, and if you think about these two other world superpowers and what they're doing, um, that should be a concern to people not just concerned about health. Especially after what's happened the past few years. Uh, exactly. <laughs> as we move on uh, to the, I, we have one more question. I have some quick audience questions as we move toward the end of the interview. Uh, Dr. Rachel Pillich uh, Loeb here on Fire Breathing Rob. Rachel, let's talk about this. I, I'll call you Doc. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, let's call you Doc. So, Doc. Uh, Rachel was just fine. Too. Okay, Rachel's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rachel, so let's talk about this. It seems like, you know, we've seen a lot of these, and this is where we get, you know, I know you spoke about the red state, blue state kind of deal with the virus. We're seeing Texas uh, getting rid of their mask mandate. They also, as if people are baseball fans on here, the Texas Rangers are going to be opening up their stadium to full capacity. So good luck with uh, people wearing masks outdoors in a big stadium, 40,000 people. Uh, the right. NFL said that they're going to be opening up in September. I know that's a few months down the road, but... That's uh, 40, 50, 60,000 people in a stadium. So with that said, and all these states, are, you know, mostly red states, we'll be honest, are getting rid of their mask mandates and opening up these big facilities to have concerts, sporting events. Are you worried that this is opening up so uh, fast? And we've heard the, CD, the new CDC director come out and she actually said that we're opening up too fast. She also said that she's worried that 
you know, the virus, um, as far as people, you know, getting it is going back up again due to people relaxed and due to people feeling, okay, the vaccines are out there and, uh, you know, who cares? We're good now. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm definitely concerned. I think that uh, Dr. Linsky's quote was there's impending right. doom. Uh, and, you know, I'm... That, but it, which was striking, I think, for her for her to say, and um, you know, a lot of people have have talked about that. I think that the reality is that yes, we're opening too fast. You know, Texas and, and several states removed uh, all forms of of um, uh, virus control um, before they were even vaccinating most people, right? So it was not even in relationship to the vaccine, and it was just that the vaccines now exist, and frankly, the vaccines do nothing if people aren't taking them. Uh, and so I, I definitely think it was premature. I mean, I even think in, in New York State, where I, I'm i based, um, the cases are going up and, and reopening steps are continuing. Well, if, if there's anything that, you know, the governor in New York has said or the mayor of New York City over the past year, it's that, I'm so sorry, one second. Yeah, you're good, you're good. <laughs> I have a one-year-old who. Uh, yeah, I heard in the background a while back, but I just me meanders it uh, around. Um, that's okay. Sorry, I was I was saying that uh, hopefully we can edit that out, and if not, yeah, 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 we can edit it from home. <laughs> yeah, that's um, why we have the editing. <laughs> We're yeah. Good. Um, but, you know, even New York, uh, wh who has been kind of more, which has been a more conservative state in terms of COVID control measures compared to the South, we see cases are going up, but reopening is continuing. They've removed all quarantine restrictions for domestic travel, for example. Well, we know that plenty of other states have gone, gone totally bonkers with their removal of, of um, restrictions. So if we have all domestic travelers coming into New York, well, the virus is just going to keep start circulating here again. Uh, and so I think that the idea is there is this pressure to reopen, to move things along, but the data points we have at this point in time do not suggest that we should be doing that yet. Yeah. Um, and so I, I definitely have those, those same kind of co co concerns as to what's going on. You know, I'm worried, scared to death that you know, living in Florida, that all these people from all over the country, all over the world are coming here to go to theme parks. And, you know, if people aren't getting vaccinated, these people that are coming in and we don't know how, you know, if they did or not, it's going to go sky high again here again. So what is your opinion on the vaccine passports? Totally. I saw that your governor also said, you know, no vaccine passports here. It's people's yeah. freedom to choose whether or not they, they get the vaccine or whatever. Um, and, and frankly... The, I lost you for a the, second. Though I, I don't agree with the right. Hold on. I lost, lost you, Rachel, for a second. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Hear. Now you're good. Now you're good. Okay, great. <laughs> um, it, it is, at the moment, an individual choice to get the vaccine. Um, right. And the, the, I guess, role of the passport is to incentivize people who have access to the vaccine to actually take it because they can then participate in events that they otherwise, or travel or whatever it is that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, you know, I think that the, in theory, there's a potential value for vaccine passports so that, uh, you know, we can feel more comfortable about large scale gatherings and people kind of being together about travel, et cetera. I think that the challenge I see with them is one around is twofold. One is we don't currently have vaccines available for everybody. And so it's hard to say, okay, we're going to use vaccine passports, but you don't even have the option to participate in that program at the moment. Um, and it seems like, for example, in New York State, the vaccine passports, the, this something called the Excelsior Pass, which is a, a, a uh, in line with being a vaccine passport was being rolled out. Uh, and then three days later, eligibility opened up to all everybody over 30. And so it seemed convenient timing basically to say, we want to use this pass so we're just going to open up eligibility, even if that's not kind of consistent with when we were going to do it beforehand. So um, I don't think it, I think that there could be value to them. I think they can incentivize people to get the vaccine. And I think we do have a lot of people who are hesitant or skeptical or don't think they need it. Uh, but my concern is one about practicality and about ethics, really, because I think that there are a lot of people who do not have the, the ability to get it um, or who are otherwise 
really mistrustful in vaccines and in government and in, frankly in the passport concept in and of themselves and we are just creating a, a bigger and bigger divide between uh those right. two groups those who would use the passport and those who wouldn't well i i go back to my college days and i'm worried that people <laughs> are gonna just you know like people had got fake ids to get into bars and nightclubs people are gonna get totally. fake vaccine vaccine passports and just do yeah. that and not even yeah, get the vaccine. Totally. So, I mean, you can totally see ways in which this system is going to be abused. I think that the other thing is we don't know how long the vaccines last. We don't know how they're going to work against all sorts of variants. Who's going to monitor that the vaccine passports are being kept up to date? How much data are we willing to additionally give whatever monitoring body is going to be looking into these passports? Is it private companies that's getting our health data? Is it a governmental mega system? You know, I think there's a lot of questions that don't have answers, and yet the system is being like rolled out tomorrow not actually but rolled out a lot faster um than than perhaps uh it should be to answer some of these questions and who's going to enforce it are we really going to rely on like a random bar or restaurant to be like yep let me see your vaccine passport I don't, or you know um and maybe yes maybe they're comfortable with that because of you know the fear of whatever if they don't check it but i think that you know we just we're asking a lot of a lot of organizations that would be enforcing this also. So I think that there's there there could be benefits, but there's a lot more questions than answers at this point in time. I got a couple of questions about friends and families that are worried about taking the vaccine. Uh, people's friends and family that are still calling it just the flu, it's a hoax and all this stuff. So I'm going to combine those two questions together. What would you say to these people that you know, uh, first of all, are hesitant to get the vaccine. And secondly, the people that are still calling it just the flu, it's the hoax, like the president was saying all throughout the election process. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're regurgitating that information. Should we even engage with people that are talking like that? Is it even worth it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, be prepared that these conversations can be exhausting, but they can also be fruitful. So one of the best ways to talk with somebody who's that or to think about um, engaging with someone who's vaccine hesitant is to have kind of a one on one conversation. No. <laughs> Broke up. Is it that? Could you can you hear me? Yeah, no, I got you. Broke up okay. for a second, but go ahead. Um. You know, I think there's a lot of reasons people are concerned about taking the vaccines. Maybe they feel like the vaccines were made too fast. Maybe they're scared of the side effects. Maybe they think they don't need it. Maybe they mistrust government entirely. And depending on what the reason is, your kind of response or what you would do may be a little bit different. So you want to acknowledge kind of where they're coming from and why they may be coming from that place. Mm -hmm. uh, and then think about you know, how to kind of respectfully try and pivot whatever that reason is. And, and be prepared that it may not be one conversation, but it could be two, it could be three, but there is a, there is potential uh, for it to move in, move in a positive direction. I also think that depending on the person, let's right. say it's, it's you, let's say it's your mom that doesn't want to get the vaccine, but let's say you have a kid or you have a family gathering you want to plan or you want to whatever. You can also just say if, if the rash, if the conversation kind of isn't re working, you know, look, mom, I get it. It's not your thing, but there are things it's important to me. It affects me. It affects X, Y, and Z. Um, you not having it, the best thing, I would just love if you can get it so we can all go to X, X place. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that so there's some that where you can talk through what the questions and concerns are. There's some where there's going to be kind of a, an incentive oriented approach that, that may be impactful. Um, and then there's going to be some cases kind of like with the hoax, COVID deniers, et cetera, where it's going to be most difficult to change their actual beliefs, right? We like, I, there are some people that are just super hardened in their, in their beliefs um, where they may, they may not be able to be convinced otherwise. You know, you could point to Trump or someone that they respect who has gotten the vaccine. You know, he did come out and talk about how he got it. You know, he was fine, um, et cetera. Obviously, it took some time for him right. to do that, but he did it. Um, and, you know, basically saying, okay, well, even though he thinks it's a hoax, he still got the vaccine. So it's in some ways, it's like you don't address the underlying belief, but they could still be willing to take the action. And so I guess the three strategies are engage the individual around their questions, think about what would be an, 
like a relevant incentive to them or like something that would be meaningful to that to their family or like their personal life um and then uh focus on the action and what the action could could be uh and and a, a trust a leader that they respect having taken yeah. that action if you could talk about the covid long haul is is that true so there are people who have had serious long-term effects of COVID-19 um, and that they've been termed long haulers. So they still mm -hmm. have, and the constellation of symptoms um, can really vary, uh, but they have been significant. They're either they've had lung damage, they've had uh, sleep disruptions, they've had brain fog. You know, there's been a lot, a series of, of um, different, different symptoms people have had. There is a, some evidence that the COVID-19 vaccine is helping people with these symptoms. So even though they're still experiencing long-term consequences of the virus, a lot of them are taking the vaccine and we are, are seeing some promising kind of results about that. So with the coronavirus shot, do you believe that this will be a reoccurring shot, something like the flu shot that you're going to have to get every year? I'm not sure that it's going to be annual, but I could see us needing boosters. Um, similar to, so the way the mRNA vaccine at least is designed, um, you know, the you get the first one, you give the body its instructions to make the protein to then respond to the antibodies. When you get that second shot, it's kind of showing that it's working, right? It's make it's yeah. doing that. Uh, and you could see what, if there are new variants, especially, that we would need kind of a little bit of a, a modification to those instructions uh, from, from another dose of the mRNA vaccine. So I'm not positive that it's going to be, or I'm not sure that it would necessarily be annual. It may be kind of in response to what's going on with the virus. If we see cases going up, if we see new variants, then it would be necessary to take a, take a booster. Okay, and lastly, where can people find more about you and learn more about you, Rachel, in general? <laughs> Um, so I have a profile on the, the Harvard School of Public Health Emergency Preparedness Program website. I have my, my own website. It's rpilchlobe.com. And uh, find me on Twitter at rpilchlobe. Thanks, Dr. Rachel Pilchlobe here on Fire Breathing Around. Thanks so much for your time. You really explained a lot. I learned a lot personally. And <laughs> Thank I appreciate you. Good, great you. And questions. <laughs> I'm sure everybody will learn a lot when they hear this. But thanks so much.